Open houses are a way to generate more business than most agents can handle, but a lot of agents don't know how to do it right because it's one of those things they don't teach you in real estate school. If I told you that you could do one month of open houses and make like $50,000, would you actually put in the work? And before you say yes, let's talk through it. Be ready to take some notes because if you don't, well, you know what happens when you show up to things and you're not ready to actually take notes and remember what, uh, what we're asking. And this is not going to be short. I'm calling this a master crash because it's not a master class. It's a, a crash course on how to get your first open house in the books and to do it well. So I met most of my early clients through open houses for other agents listings and have personally generated probably, I don't know, around uh, $150,000 from those. And that's with only doing like half of what I know, like half the work. So let's talk about the purpose of an open house. We need to be very clear on the purpose. It's for you to generate conversations with people and get their contact information, period. Not for them to get your contact information, for you to get theirs. Everything else is just noise and flattery, okay? It's like dating. Not walking up to people and saying, hey, wanna have sex, wanna have sex? That's a Tom Perry quote, but no, you're not doing that. You're saying, hey, let's talk a little bit. Let's get to know each other. They might buy the house at the open house, sure, but it's very rare, right? They might be an agent themselves. They might be a neighbor, an investor, the listing agent. I've had people, I've had listing agents stop by. I've even had sellers stop by uh, because you typically don't know who they are and they just want to come in and check on you. And that's fine. You want to still be able to have that conversation and have an intelligent conversation with whoever this person is that's coming into the open house. One note, higher price points generally mean more educated buyers. I don't make the rules. I'm just saying when I say more educated, I mean they have a realtor representing them already or have realtor representation. So keep that in mind if you're looking for an open house and you're targeting a certain uh, price point, for example. Um, also, if it's someone else's listing and you're sitting there holding the house open, well, if someone else is listing, they're going to come in you know, the, the client might come in or the potential client customer might come in with another agent. Where does that put you? Who are you representing in that point? This is really important for you to know. My first open house, nobody told me this. And so understanding that I'm still representing the seller, but I've got no claim to any commission until I really understand how I'm able to help somebody. And maybe I could co uh, collaborate with that agent, but that's neither here nor there. This is a discussion for another day. Okay. Uh, branding. Uh, anytime you do an open house, this is still part of the purpose. Anytime you do an open house, it's branding. People see you. They see you out there working. They see your signs. Uh, and if you're out there every weekend, it's a low probability that other agents are going to be out there as frequently as you. So if you're farming a neighborhood, this is a great way to build branding and uh, name recognition for an area. And that's you're the knowledge broker of the area. Imagine also having a hundred pictures and videos of houses that you can use at any time for your social media that you didn't have to pay for. Okay. Or download illegally off of Zillow or the MLS. You're not supposed to just go and right click and download pictures and videos, right? You're supposed to take your own or buy them. And so this is an open house is a great way to spend the time collecting content for your future social media posts because the houses are open as long as it's uh, advertised as such. That's really important, okay? Uh, imagine having an office to work away from your kids or dogs or partners that, again, you don't have to pay for. You can do that. You can leverage an open house and treat it like an office space if you wanted to. I've done that a few times. It works out really, really well. Uh, I've done even evening open houses at schools or near schools where, not at schools, near schools, where the parent-teacher conferences are being let out. And I've done them with construction homes uh, new construction homes where I get all buddy, buddy with the sales rep. Like that's a great opportunity for you to build further relationships. And I've done them for agents as a favor, just because sometimes they need the help. Uh, and now one of them is a friend that actually joined, uh, my broker or joined real broker and partnered with me. So, um, it's all planting seeds and <laughs> except with miracle grow. If you really think about it, there's going to be people along the way that come in and basically ask if you can help them. And that's, what you want. You want to be front and center at the open house when someone's walking in uh, through the door, okay? To be able to have that conversation and build these relationships. Let's talk about ways to get an open house. I've had agents that are stingy and they wouldn't let me hold it open. I had one guy 
And he said, well, do you even know what you're doing? And I was like, okay, fine, thanks. That was one of my earlier ones. And uh, over time, we ended up building a little bit more of a rapport because I basically called and said, hey, can I hold your house open? Didn't know what it meant, didn't know what I needed to do. So uh, some people will say their brokers won't allow it, but if you can end up building a relationship with an agent that understands that the point is to expose the property to more people, which then helps their seller, helps them get a commission, then lean on them for opportunities. You have some agents that say, I'm gonna do my own open house because what it gets gives me is a chance to meet all these buyers and maybe double end the deal, right? Which if an, if an agent is double ending a deal and they don't know what they're doing, that's probably not best for their clients, right? So uh, that's, it depends on where you are, right? I'm in the state of Texas and that's a, a no-no unless you're really good. You have to get approval from the broker. So one thing that helps you acquire an open house from another agent, if it's not your listing, is to have a discussion with them, call them, while you're asking permission, let them know how you plan to help them sell this property. If there's any marketing you're going to be doing, right? So if you're going to do any kind of ads, and we'll get into that later, if there's any, if you're going to share it on your social media, if you are going to make sure to provide feedback from everybody that walks into the door, that's what the agent wants so that they can give that to the seller and the seller thinks, okay, well, that agent did a lot of work. Right? They found somebody to hold the house open. They got all this feedback from the clients. Now I have uh, objectionable information or subjective information, either one that I can use to adjust the price point or some of the features of the home. Let's talk about marketing here. And uh, I think we've got a couple more uh, pieces to go through. So let's talk about marketing. Marketing is probably going to take the longest to explain. So the first thing you want to think about is nobody knows you and nobody cares. Just because you have a house that you can hold open doesn't mean anybody's going to come through it. So the job of marketing is to get people excited and to get people walking through the door. There are a lot of ways you can do that. It's just like lead generation for agents. There are a lot of ways you can generate leads. Most people think there's one or two. No, there's a hundred. So here's an example. I would say the first thing you want to do is create an event on Eventbrite. Why Eventbrite? Because Eventbrite will will create an event and it pushes it out to people that are on Eventbrite. And it's it's a, a free app, it's locally based, and so when people are searching in a city for things to do, your open house could come up for free. Isn't that crazy? And then Eventbrite links with Facebook business pages. So not only do you have the event created there, but you also have Facebook, which is doing the same thing, trying to vie for people's attention and uh, their their, what they want to do this weekend. And so there's a whole Facebook event section. So if you create an on Eventbrite, Eventbrite for free, it'll double up. And now Eventbrite and Facebook are pushing it out for you. Again, for free, right? Uh, another element is Google My Business. If you don't already have a Google My Business, send me a DM on Instagram at Ian of Austin. We need to talk about this. But Google My Business is another free tool. And think about how many people, when they're looking for anything, you yourself included, when you're looking for something, you either go to TikTok, YouTube, or Google these days in 2023. That's what people are doing. So think about that. Google is a way to find information. If somebody's looking for open houses this weekend, there's a high probability that yours would come up on your page or on Facebook or on Eventbrite. So no reason to not triple down. All three are free and they give you so much search engine optimization and exposure, okay? Like, there's just no reason. If you do nothing else, do that. Um, also, this is really important. When you're putting these events out on any of these platforms, don't give the farm away. Don't give them every picture of the house and don't give a full tour of the house. The whole idea is that you're enticing them to come to the house. If they think they've seen it, they don't need you anymore. They don't, they don't know that they need you anymore. So don't give them that pleasure. Give them a, an excuse to come and talk to you, however that is. If you did an intro video saying, hey, I'm holding an open house this weekend, I just wanna let you know, it is the most incredible value in this neighborhood. You'd hate to miss it because there's probably gonna be a lot of people coming through and I'm actually expecting an offer. I look forward to seeing you. Here's the address, make sure you sign up. I'm doing a raffle, by the way. And so that's something that you can submit or send out as a video that entices people to come to the open house. <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading through uh, a lot of these bullet points that I wanna make sure that you're able to, to catch. So when you're creating events for 
an open house that's on Saturday, don't put it out on Friday night. That's just not good business. It's not, it doesn't give the search engines time to spread it out to people. It also doesn't give people time. There are a few people that operate last minute, right? There are people that'll wake up on Saturday mornings and hear their partner say, we gotta go see an open house. And you're like, and they're like, okay. And then they search right then and there. But a lot of people will start looking at lunchtime on Thursday or Friday, or maybe even a week before. So all I'm saying is the earlier, the better, when you wanna establish uh, some kind of social media platform recognition for these events being available, okay? Uh, it's just like when you're listing a house, you don't list it on Friday, on Saturday morning. No, you try to list it on a Thursday. That just works out so much better. It gives people time to plan for it. Now, uh, imagine if, if they don't even wanna go to the open house to begin with. And that's, I think that's a lot of people that are, I think that's just a lot of people. Oh, oh what's happening with my camera? Give me a sec. Well, I'm just gonna keep talking. I'm not gonna let this bother me. Okay, so uh, imagine how many people don't wanna go to an open house. Like, it's like going to the grocery store. You don't wanna do it half the time, right? Um, if you don't wanna go, what is it that gets these people excited about showing up? Or once they're there, gets them to have a conversation with you. So you just wanna think about that. And that goes back to, if you're creating this video, what you're telling them in this video. You can put a, a video, you can put a reel on Instagram and you can advertise the event on Google, for example, but why would they come, right? You can't just say, I'm doing an open house. They don't care about that. What they care about is maybe the schools, right? Maybe there's something in the area that's enticing. Maybe it's great amenities. Maybe it's a lot of land. And maybe you're there to show them how they can win at submitting an offer because this house is an exceptional deal and you're a strong negotiator, right? Give them some meat to latch onto when you're inviting them to this open house. The next thing to ask, wait, sorry. The next thing I wanna talk about is a flyer. Have you ever created a good flyer? And I'm not talking about you sent it to your friend or your daughter or whatever and said, hey, can you create a flyer for me? Or even your lender. Most lenders, no offense, if you're a lender, a mortgage lender listening to this, no offense, but most lender flyers suck. They're really bad. Uh, most flyers that people create are pretty terrible. They don't even give, they don't even give very solid information. I use an app. Uh, I'll put it in the description below, but basically it lists out, it's a free app. You can partner with a lender for even more robust features, but the free portion gives you uh, a website. It gives you base information about the house. You can upload your own pictures and then it shows stuff like walkability score. Can you imagine that? It says, hey, there are three hiking trails within five miles of this home. There are seven schools within 10 miles of this home. There are 23 restaurants within three miles of this home. That is huge, okay? And you're now giving this information out to people. So they're looking at you like an expert, even if you have no idea what those restaurant, those 23 restaurants are. So leverage something like these flyers. And also it looks good. It looks like you're professional and like you're prepared. And so people like to see that when they think that you're a professional and they want to work with you. Or if you're walking up to them and saying, hey, I'm a professional, prove it. All right, let's talk about signs. <clears throat> One of the early misconceptions I had is that I didn't need to put out a lot of signs. I was thinking I'll put out five, right? No, you want 20 to 30 signs for every single open house. And it sounds like overkill and it might be. But that's okay because wouldn't you rather have a lot of people see your signs, and again, it goes back to that brand recognition, versus no one seeing your signs, and then you're at this open house accomplishing probably nothing. <laughs> and you can order special, so if you're, um, if depending on your city, I'm at in Austin, so the Austin Board of Realtors, we have a couple facilities, one in Austin, one in Cedar Park, they're a few dollars. It doesn't cost a whole lot. You can order special signs from your brokerage. So like at, at uh, Real Broker, where I am, uh, we can order signs. They've given us uh, tons to choose from. Uh, but there's really no need to do that until you've had a closing or two. Use the money that you gain from business to elevate your future business, okay? So don't just go out and buy signs. Borrow them from somebody. There's probably 10 realtors that are at your brokerage or something like that in your city that you can probably borrow or even rent the signs from. Say, hey, I'll give you 50 bucks. Let me borrow these signs and uh, don't be cheap. <laughs> this is this is your career. All right. And every city has rules. This is another thing I didn't know that I needed to know. 
So some cities, oh, and some neighborhoods too. So example, uh, there's a city north of Austin called Round Rock. I remember I did my first, one of my early open houses, not my first, one of my early open houses there. And there's certain roads where you need a permit to, to put a sign. So if it's a really busy location, then often, like if it's a double lane or even a quad lane highway, you can't just go put a sign there in most instances, right? You have to get a permit. Get the permit from City Hall for like $5.00. Uh, they stick to the sign, it's reusable, it's fine. Um, you only need a few like that, right? Whatever busy road you're gonna put it on. I like to do multiple entrances. So if there's a busy road over here, busy road over here, I'll put the big signs there, maybe even some balloons or one of those guys waving. And then all the way throughout, I will put the smaller signs that are directional or pointing to uh, the direction of the open house. Uh, it's a great way to do it. I like to create maps before I go out on where to place the signs. So if I'm looking at a neighborhood, you can pull that up on Google Maps, you can pull it up on the MLS, and I like to pre-plan my route for where I'm gonna put all these signs. And hopefully there are no less, this is a, a nugget, write this down. Hopefully there are no less than two turns to get to the house. No less than two turns from a major road to get to the house. Those seem to be the best traffic for volume. Not maybe the best quality of leads that come through, but the best traffic for volume. So if you can get an open house like that and it's fresh on the market, oh man, this is a great opportunity for you. <clears throat> also, um, some neighborhoods, uh, they do things like, I think Marble Falls is actually a city also west of Austin and they only let you put out brown signs. That's it, you get two, <laughs> two brown signs and that's it. Uh, some neighborhoods won't let you put out signs the day before right? Some neighborhoods will. They'll say, oh yeah, you can put it out on a Friday as long as you pick it up by Sunday. Other neighborhoods and other cities, they'll just take it. They might charge you. So you got to be careful. You can look up all of this on your city uh, or township's website that talks about signage. Um, everybody has one. Do your homework. This is important, right? Or ask someone, but really do your homework. You should learn this. So let's see. Oh yeah. So a day exists. So we talked about the website. Oh my gosh, yeah, I've had some expensive signs stolen. Last story about signs. There was a guy who actually took his signs, took my signs and threw them in the trash and I didn't know what was going on. So I walk up to his house and I'm like, hey man, uh, I, I'm sorry to bother you, but I see that my, my open house signs are in your garbage. And he's like, yeah, well, you never asked me. I was like, oh crap. I'm so, I had no idea I was supposed to. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then I left. I just kind of walked away, like defeated for a minute. And then I thought outside the box, as we have to often learn to do and adapt to the situation. What was it that he wanted me to ask him? Probably permission that it was in his yard, like that I use his yard. So he was a corner lot and I was placing signs in his yard, essentially. So what I did is I went back to, or I went to uh, HEB, which is, it stands for here, everything's better. So if you're in Texas, you already know. If you're not from Texas, that is our mecca of grocery stores. Uh, and it is better than everything. So anyway, I went to H-E-B. I got Lone Star, which is like our cheapest beer. But when the guy answered the door, I mean, he's all he's in a tank top, all tatted up, uh, half mullet, half like super long, flowy, gray hair and a big Jeep in the Anyway, I made my, I drew my own conclusions. And so I went to the store, I got Lone Star, I came back, a six pack of Lone Star. And I said, hey man, I just wanted to give a formal apology. I had no clue. I just wasn't thinking. And we had a really good conversation from there. It was so funny because he was like, listen, man, here you go. Here's your sign. I didn't damage it at all. I just, I appreciate that you asked next time. And then he goes, you know, that guy over there, that guy over there, is uh, his wife just left him. And so he's probably gonna need his house soon. You should probably talk to him. And then another one, he's talking about some kid who died. And I was like, oh my God. So he's pointing out people that are leads <laughs> that I can go talk to and get more business from. And uh, I never kept in touch with him, but who knows? I mean, we could have even stayed in touch and possibly made something happen from there. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're, <laughs> when you're uh, putting signs out. <clears throat> I've had, I've had women invite me in for coffee because their husbands are never home. And while I, I didn't go in um, because I had to get to an open house, I should have gone back at least for the listing to have the conversation, right? No, I should have done that. Didn't do it. Um, what else? Just overall, be smart. 
uh, be safe and be a person. They want to talk to people. If you're going to knock, if you get knocked on, if somebody knocks on your door, well, what, like somebody's already going to be there. What do you want them to say? Right? Like, what do you hope they're going to say? In fact, that brings me to the next one. There's door knocking and there's circle prospecting. So, uh, uh, there's even like a mass voicemail service or mass texting apps out there, but circle prospecting and voice, the mess, the voicemail messages usually cost money if you're going to do them quick. So, and you, and we have, a, so at real broker, we have a, a CRM, a database that keeps track of people called chime. And that will allow you to do some of this circle prospecting. You can buy it. <clears throat> so if you're interested in that, reach out, let me know again, Ian of Austin on Instagram. So, uh, but door knocking, let's talk about it. When you're getting to the door, you want to have something necessary. Maybe you're just knocking on the door and asking for permission for signs. Maybe you're knocking on the door and saying, Hey, listen, I'm doing an open house down the street. I don't know if you're interested at all, but if you know anybody else, you, this is an opportunity for you to be able to choose your neighbor. And I'll tell you what, this house, the floor plan is really cool. This gives you a chance to sneak peek and I'm going to have cookies. So if you're free this Saturday from two to five, I'd love it if you could stop by. Uh, it would make my day. Let me know if, if that works for you or I'll talk to you later or something like that. Just give your send off. So that's a great way. Circle prospecting, you basically can choose an address Let's say it's the address of your open house and you can buy these dialer systems that will let you, they'll get, they will give you the phone numbers and it'll randomly call all the people that are within a certain radius of your house. So let's say you pay $25 and you get a hundred numbers. You click a button, it's calls. And this is cold calling, but then somebody picks up the phone. Hey, I just want to let you know that I, uh, I'm getting ready to hold this house open, uh, right, right down the street. And it's similar to your house. The floor plan is really similar. We've got it listed right now for X amount. Um, do you want to come check it out and see if how it compares to your house? Something like that. You can just create a conversation and, and uh, use that or leverage that to um, circle prospect. I've not done circle prospecting or door knocking for six years. So I did it a lot well, for a short while. I did it a whole lot when I was doing open houses a lot. And then I stopped. I said, I never want to do that again because I just don't like it. But that's me, right? A lot of people make a very good living by doing that. Okay. You can create pay-per-click ads. If you don't know what that is, DM me on Instagram and we can talk about it. I have I have people that can help set it up for you, uh, for example. So imagine spending $50 to get 10 people to sign up to go to your open house, right? Everywhere they go on the internet, it follows them. Uh, they get an ad that's your video that's inviting them to this open house. And that can be forever. Like you can create that ad and then the only thing you change out is the video or the address to the house, right? Something like that. You could do that and set it up and pay every single time you're gonna do an open house. Uh, I have a guy that sets up uh, retargeting ads on Facebook. And again, you could be on Amazon. You could be on uh, Wish. You could be, they could be shopping for houses on Zillow and see your face like, hi, I've got an open house for you. And then wanna maybe wanna click it and show up. Um, so what do you do or what do they get when they show up? We talked about this briefly, but I want to give a little more, a little more info. So, uh, how about cookies? How about a raffle or is it just information? Like if somebody's showing up, they can get information from the internet. So why do they need you? Right? They really got to think, about, are, they, are they even getting water? <laughs> That's really important. You got it. What are you going to give them? Remember, they're not there to meet you. They're there looking for Oh, and they're not there looking for an agent. Most of them have no clue what the process is. And they're just out looking at houses because they either saw a sign or their partner or somebody said, hey, let's go look at houses. And maybe they're curious about what's going on. Maybe they're thinking about moving to the neighborhood. They could be a, they could be people in the neighborhood and they could be at an apartment complex in the neighborhood. The point is there are people that are looking to have some kind of conversation. They're just not necessarily looking for it with you. So give them, again, that enticement that gives them, that gives them uh, cause to come say hi. All right, make it easy. So when I was doing this frequently, actually I did it really early on once I learned the process, I created an open house kit. So the open house kit, uh, was in, I put it in a little travel suitcase, one of the small, um, you know, under seat, or storage uh, suitcases. And so in there I had, what did I put in there? I had um, Austin magazines or whatever city I was working on, but mostly Austin, like edible Austin, that kind of stuff that I ended up getting from HEB <laughs> off of the rack. I was like, give me 10 of those. Um, 
I had uh, community impact newspapers because they talked about what was going on in the area. I had a Bluetooth speaker. I'm just giving you my kit, but you want to change this up a little bit. So a Bluetooth speaker. So I always had sound going in the open house. It was so boring to be there. And it was a house with no furniture or anything and no internet connection and therefore no sound. Right. And I can't do it on my phone because I need my phone for lots of things. Right. Uh, usually to look up stuff or to call or something like that. I don't want it to be dead unless I have extra batteries. I had a tablet in there. So uh, for sign in, when people are coming to sign in, it was easier on a tablet and then an open house sheet that I would print out as well. And then I had a laptop. The reason why I had a laptop is because if anybody wanted to look anything up right then, I don't want to use the sign in tablet. So I had to have something else. And then the phone's usually too, so you can't like share the phone with somebody. That's just silly, it looks unprofessional. So I understand that I had multiple devices, but each device had a purpose and it kept it looking like I had things ready. <clears throat> uh, open house sign-in sheet I mentioned, I wouldn't even bring just one. I'd bring a couple of those because not everybody wants to type on a tablet or maybe you have multiple people. Unless you have multiple tablets, you gotta be prepared for that. And then I also put in tea light candles. So I had uh, the tea light candles, and I would put them in the sink because I didn't want them on the countertop. I didn't want them falling or sliding. The sink was a good barrier, but it also let me, it smelled very, very, very good. I usually got something that smelled like warm apple pie or something silly, but it, they were small and uh, it never really got hot enough where they would melt. So I would just, every open house, I would take one of those, put it in the sink, light it, and we were good to go. It always smelled wonderful in my open houses. I wasn't going to bake cookies, so what else was I going to do? <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about uh, planning an open house. We're getting through. I told you marketing was going to be the long. When you're planning an open house, if someone came to the house with you or someone came to look at the house and said, "Well, what else is going on in the area?" or "You know what? I don't like this floor plan." Do you have a response? My guess is probably not. And so this is where a CMA comes in. If you, before you go to the open house, if you run a CMA, which stands for a comparative market analysis, it gives you a chance to look at what other houses are active, pending, and sold in the neighborhood. So it allows you to have an educated conversation when it, when somebody says, hey, I, I kind of like this house, but it seems like 550,000 is a little too high. And you can say, actually one just sold three weeks ago for 575,000. So this is a really good deal, right? And now you sound like you know what what uh, what you can do or that it's a good deal and even if you don't remember you have a sheet that kind of shows that right so it's it's really really powerful uh, also if someone says uh you know i don't like this floor plan but the price is good and i love the neighborhood you can say you know what i know that there there's actually two other houses that are active as soon as i get done with this would you like to go and see it what because it's probably not going to be have an open house as well right so you're now their catalyst to go see these houses that are in the same neighborhood that they already like, but have a better floor plan or a different floor plan and instant appointment. You got to be really clever with this kind of stuff. You can be really clever. <clears throat> if you have time, tour the neighborhood, right? A lot of people, they've never, they just go straight to the house. They open up the door. They put, they may put out a few signs and then they're done. And they're like, okay, why is nobody showing up? Whoa. Oh, Learn the neighborhood. At least look at the flyer that tells you what's going on in the neighborhood. Does it have an amenity center? Is it nice? How far is this house from the amenity center? How far is it from the, the pools? Uh, sorry, I said the pools, the schools. I've had a, a house listing right across the street from a school. It took forever to sell and I thought this would be the easiest because it's right across the street. You can watch your kids walk over to the, it was it was actually the timing in the market, but and then the sellers wouldn't go down in price. It should have sold pretty quickly. Um, Anyway, so it's neither here nor there. <clears throat> you want to think, you want to know a little bit about the HOA if you can. If you start doing the same neighborhood a lot, that's how you end up learning a whole lot about that neighborhood, right? Literally anything important. Does it have large trees? Is this the largest yard in the neighborhood that, uh, for the house for sale? Is it similar to the new construction homes that you can get that are that are $100,000 more, right? That education all comes from... CMA. Not all, but a lot of it comes from a CMA and then being experienced by doing more open houses in the neighborhood. You can ask the agent the questions, the listing agent. I'm going to tell you, most of them don't know. They have no clue because they have their transaction coordinator put the listings out. Okay. <clears throat> How can you find out what makes the home unique? 
there was there were a few opportunities where I got to talk to the seller because I showed up early for the open house. And I'll ask him that question. I'll say, what are the five reasons? Like, give me five reasons why you bought this house over anything else. And they'll tell you right there. But you don't always have that luxury. So what other things can you do? Usually there's a description in the MLS written by the agent or a transaction coordinator. So I always look at that. The CMA will help you a little bit. Um, you want to, if it's a new construction community, maybe go and tour uh, some of the new construction homes and see if it's just a floor plan that they've got a sheet for. They might already have a floor plan sitting there. The documents in the MLS for this house will show you a seller's disclosure, which gives you all of the information that the seller is, is telling the buyers about. Surveys, there's so, there's so much wealth of information, tax records, everything. You could look up the tax record, it's free, right? At least in our MLS in Texas, other states are different. California doesn't tell you anything, but I can go in there, click a button and it'll show me exactly what the loan amount is on their home and how much they paid for it three years ago in the MLS, right? That's information that people walking in won't have. That's value. And you don't want to necessarily give them that because you're not representing them yet, but you can use that information to, to, um, as an educated conversation piece. <clears throat> Sorry. It's a lot of talk. <laughs> <clears throat> so you want to find what can make this home unique because that's a great way, great way when you show up to be prepared for a conversation with people. Uh, hopefully, like I, I've had open houses where um, the house flooded and a woman died inside. It's like, oh crap. Right? Like, you, like how would you know that? Seller's disclosure is, is one way or maybe talking to the seller or something like that, right? Uh, title companies, they know. Ask them, hey, what do you know about this house? They can look it up for you. How many people are you planning for? I think uh, a lot of us just kind of go and make up this arbitrary number. Oh, I'm, I'm hoping 10 people come in, right? But what if 30 people come in? Like, do you have enough water? Do you have enough water for half? What are you going to do? Uh, speaking of water, I just want to throw this out there. Uh, in my open house kit, which I forgot to mention, I would also add um, crystal light. So I'd have water bottles and I have crystal light. And so crystal light was because not everybody wanted water. I used to do wine. Problem with wine, I the little Sutter Home wines, and you can get, spend $6 and you could have a bunch of them, four of them. Uh, the problem is uh, red wine stains carpets. So it stains everything. Don't do that. And then that's the first reason. The second reason is I found out about TABC and they're the Texas alcohol somebody um, body of censorship, <laughs> alcoholic censorship. That basically, they will they will find you and could possibly even take away your real estate license if they found out that somebody got you know drunk and then into an accident as a result of you handing them wine at an open house. So you got to be careful with that kind of stuff. These are all things we start to learn. Uh, I also um, in my kit. I don't know why I'm uh, sorry that I'm a little bit out of order, but this is uh, important and kind of goes back to planning. Uh, also in my kit, I had a bowl like this, just a small little bowl, and I would get snacks. And when I say snacks, I would have like uh, roasted almonds individually packaged. I would have, um, what else did I have in there? Protein bars because not everybody wanted candy and then uh, candy melts, right? So there were some some things that I would put in there and I'd put them all out in the bowl next to a few other things. And uh, we'll talk about that. So uh, where are we at? We talked about how many people you're planning, planning for. Oh gosh, uh, I remember I had a time, there were like three families walking in and then one kid grabbed my iPad that you're supposed to sign in on. And I wasn't even paying attention. I just realized he was walking around an iPad. I hear him playing uh, Clash Clash of Clans or Clash Royale or something like that. And I was like, oh, I, I have that. And then I was like, wait a minute, that is mine. So the kid was in there. He had gotten out of the app and started playing with games on my iPad. So that's the kind of stuff you got to be ready for. Uh, toilet paper. Do you have that in your open house kit? Oh my gosh. As, while we're here, let's keep talking about the uh, actual event. You want to have signs out as early as you can before the open house. You don't want people to show up and you look unprepared or you're showing up, putting out the last sign and then the open house doesn't start. Uh, let's say it's supposed to start at 11 and you're showing up at 11.10 <laughs> because you just got finished putting out the signs. And if you're putting signs out yourself, you'll probably sweat a lot, especially if you're in a warm climate and need to have another shirt ready. So, or maybe even get your pants dirty. So you really want to think about having a change of clothes if you can. Um, also, when you're putting out signs, some of them are a little rough, like a little tough to get into the ground. And uh, um, having 
a, a bottle of water or a jug of water might help you get the signs into the ground. You could always hope that their water's turned on and they have a hose hooked up to the spigot if you need to soften the ground. But anyway, that, those are just extra little tips. <laughs> if you're uh, So depending on the signs you buy, we talked about you might need a mallet to get some of them knocked into the ground. Uh, some of them are so cheap, they bend in the break. The $3 ones are super cheap. Like you can snap them like a twig um, and maybe you can breathe too hard and they just won't work. But uh, some of them just unfold. Those are the most expensive ones and usually you want to save that for your custom. It might be $30 a piece or something like that. But think about how great that is. That How quickly you can put out signs that go like this. Boop, 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 right? Versus having to try to like <laughs> nail and step and, and mallet these tiny little uh, weak signs into the ground. So having to pour water and all that sort of stuff, it's a pain in the butt. It really is. If you're a really big, if you're a big baller, you can uh, hire a service. We've got a service here in Austin that will put out the signs for you. You just, uh, you got to pay them a monthly fee. And then um, maybe you have a kid. Maybe that's a reason to have a kid. They can put the signs out for you. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the presentation. So is there a cute door hanger on the door with your logo? How about uh, nice flyers? We talked about that and flyers outside, right? Does it smell good inside the house? Is there furniture for people to sit on? Most people shouldn't be sitting in an open house, but for you to sit on, uh, that's important. If you're doing a vacant house and you didn't know it was vacant because it had virtual staging, well, that's a conversation. Is there music? Do you even have internet access? Hopefully you have a device that will allow you to create a hotspot for your laptop and your tablet because a lot of the software won't let you, uh, will need the internet in order for you to let people sign in. Uh, or if you're on your phone and you're walking around the house, well, that might be your only source of music if you have one client here and another client there. So anyway, that's, that's all part of the conversation. I had an acrylic holder for my MLS sheet. So it's basically a little document holder. I'd slide the MLS sheet in there and then that way nobody could take it, but they could look at it. And if they wanted to talk about it, I was there to talk to them. Because if you just leave something there for people to take, they're gonna grab it and try not to talk to you. That's what most people like to do, right? Uh, I'd have a sign, the sign-in sheet would have a pin next to it. I had, I had a lot in this open house kit that I forgot to mention. Uh, there would be a pin in it. Uh, and then you also had the electronic sign-in version. I would try to push them toward that, but there were a handful of people that needed a pen. And so if you do have a tablet, maybe you have the tablet with the magic pen too. Let's see. Uh, oh, and after, so we just went through this pandemic thing. So uh, I used to do it before, put hand sanitizer next to everything, but now it's kind of a, a mandatory thing just in case. Maybe they want booties. Maybe they don't want people to. Maybe they want people to take off their shoes before they come in the house. You have a lot of, you have a lot of uh, particular needs from people. And uh, let's talk about the treat, the snacks again. If you're going to get snacks, instead of a, <laughs> instead of a bucket full of Reese's that are going to melt and get all icky, and then there's like all these hands in it. Look for things that are uh, individually wrapped. Those always work out better. Even cookies. Cookies smell great. Little pieces of cake or pie smells wonderful, but it's not. Uh, healthy, right? Like it's, well, one, it's not healthy, but also it's not sanitary is what I was looking for. <clears throat> are you lurking at the door? If somebody shows up to your open house, are you lurking? Are you lurking at the door? Are you peeking through the window? Uh, what are you doing? Are you at the kitchen counter working? You got like, you have to think about that. And this is the day of, you want to be prepared. You don't want to have to think about what to do in the moment. You want to already know kind of how you're going to plan this out. Is there a yard sign? Right? The listing agent probably has a sign. I, I almost always put a sign in my yard uh, for a listing. And then a flyer box. So sometimes there is a flyer box that the listing agent will put out. If not, when you're picking up signs at uh, the board of realtors, get your own. I would put as, I would seriously put a flyer box at every single open house. And then I'd be really creative and take the one of one flyer, one flyer, put it inside the flyer box and tape it. Right, because what happened, and you can get uh, flyer boxes that light up by the way for night, but what happens is people, I've had so many people, probably 50 people over the years would drive by, and I'd know because I'm sitting there watching them through the window. They'd drive up, they'd look in the flyer box, they'd grab a flyer, and then they'd get in the car and leave. Like they, it's almost like they were afraid to talk to me because I was going to try to sell them something. So uh, I stopped letting them have that right, <laughs> you know? Um, Flyer boxes allow you to put business cards in there, but the same thing's going to happen. So instead, um, you're going to laugh at this one. So business cards, 
I like to hide throughout the house and I'll always count them out, right? So I might be, I, I might put three in the primary bathroom on top of the countertop. I might put three uh, in an entryway and I might put a couple on the banister as soon as they're like halfway up the stairs. Like I'll think about that, I'll count them out. And what I've noticed is if I put three, one might be gone. So people are taking these, <laughs> I know it's working, but it's funny because they're taking them from these places and they're not taking them from the countertop that I have this whole spread and all that sort of stuff and I'm usually standing at, right? It's almost like they wanna be sneaky about it. Like, how are you gonna be sneaky about it and then call me later? Really? I don't get people, but I just, I put, I, I've even, I've gone as far as to put it in uh, the bathroom mirror uh, and I put it on the stairs as you're walking up the stairs so you kind of see it. That's, those have never been taken. I just thought it was funny. <laughs> we talked about, um, we've talked about a lot. Oh, do you know anything about the, the other houses that are currently for sale in the area? You want to be able to talk to those, but if you can't, then having a laptop with an internet connection will help you. So you should have the MLS open and ready to search if people come in. Maybe set people up on a search right away. Shoot, maybe you have a lender there that's able to do uh, pre-quals on the spot. Right? Maybe you have another agent who's a partner or a friend of yours that can do CMAs on the spot. That gets you their information, CMAs for their houses. Right? That is so cool because it gives you something um, to talk to people about. Oh my gosh, before you get to the house, do you know if there's a super key? Super is what we use here in Austin, Texas, and it's the one that's Bluetooth to your phone. But there are other places, some people might only do a combo box. Like if you don't know that and you show up at this house doing an open house, you're gonna be in a world of hurt because you won't be able to get in. Uh, and then, I, I mean, I've had, I've been locked out of houses. I've had alarms go off when I opened the door and then the cops showed up. And I was like, okay, well, this is a lot of fun. <clears throat> uh, we talked about furniture and internet. If there's no furniture uh, and, and no Wi-Fi, you'll need something to keep you busy for four hours. Let's talk about scripts. Scripts are huge. They're probably the most, one of the most important things about an open house. And I'm not gonna give you a lot. What I am gonna give you, I'm gonna ask you three questions. So if a stranger walks in this house, can you answer these three questions? I'm gonna start with the questions first and then I'm gonna go through and explain what they are. One, is the seller willing to do seller financing? Two, what is the tax rate in this area? And three, how much will you cut your commission? If you don't have a fast answer for all three of these, be prepared, right? <clears throat> and they may not come up often, but I remember my first time some guy asked me about the tax rate and I was just like, I think I made something up. Most, let's go through, let's go in order. So seller financing, you might not even be allowed to have that conversation in your state. So this gives you, it gives you an indication that they know something that you probably don't if you don't already know. Plus it could give away the motivation for the seller, right? Your job is not to, <clears throat> is to have a conversation and get them enticed to buy, but not to tell them information that's not public about the seller. So you could end up being in a lot of trouble if you start answering questions like that uh, and you don't even know, um, don't even know uh, what the true answer is. Or even if you do, maybe you don't answer that question, right? What about the tax rate in the area? So I remember the first guy, he caught me way off guard and most agents, they don't even know what they'll tell you. And seriously, start asking around, right? And you're probably thinking this right now. I don't know what the tax Start asking around. Anytime you talk to an agent, anytime I talk to an agent or, or we're on a podcast, I'll bring up the tax rate. I'm like, what's the tax rate in your area? That's how I know if they're full of it. Because what they'll say usually is, oh, well, we pay like 15,000 or we pay like 3,000 or we pay, right? But that's not the tax rate. That is how much they pay in taxes based on the tax rate usually, but also, that's not necessarily including exemptions because their exemptions are going to be different than other people, right? If you have a homestead exemption, if you have an agricultural exemption. So all that to say, you need to understand what the tax rate is. And if someone asks you that question and you're not able to answer, you look like a fool with your pants. You know where your pants are on the ground. Uh, and then the commission question is just, that's just a good business practice to have because you're going to get that question a whole lot. And most realtors freeze or try to come up with a number or, you know, tell them to flip the bird. But really, you just... You want to ask why, like what, what is it? Why are you asking that question? May I ask what the reason for that question is? Something like that, which lets you know 
what they think they know because it becomes a deeper conversation. They might say, oh, I just I was told by my friend that I need to ask because all, all realtors cut, will cut their commission if you ask. But you don't know. So don't tell your story, your, yourself a story. Let them answer that question. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to give an example. I was recently in Vegas with for a Tom Ferry event with Phil Jones. And he wrote the book called Exactly What to Say. I met him. He's a great guy. Uh, he's 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 doing a lot of training. This guy is super sharp. So I'm gonna give a script that he had given. So um, you give your standard intro like, hey, I'm Ian. Nice to meet you. First question you ask them, how did you find us? Right. Second question, what brings you in? And then one of the best questions after that to ask is, where are you living right now? And the reason why you ask these questions is because it's not closed. It's not a closed question and it's not invasive. You're not saying, well, are you pre-qualified? Do you have an agent? Like people hear that and they're like, oh my God, I can't get away from this. Free, right? You don't want to pressure them into that. You want to have a conversation just like you are if you're meeting somebody in the wild for the first time. I know it's been a little bit since we had this whole pandemic thing, but let's get back to it. Um, you don't want to crowd people if you can avoid it, right? Uh, hey, I need everybody to sign into the open house before they're let in. Maybe two years ago, maybe 10 years ago, but that's not really the, the vibe these days, especially if you have a um, someone from a different culture or a younger generation. You got to be careful with how you're approaching people, right? Um, send them off the tour. Say, hey, listen, uh, you should go check out this closet and th there's a window in it, which is really nice because as you're changing clothes, you can tell the blue socks from the black socks. It's great. And then when they come back, you can ask them what they thought. And then you have a reason to have a conversation before they try to sneak out in front of you. Uh, and then you can say, hey, would you be willing to leave that information for the seller? And if they won't leave it, say, listen, I'll type it. Just what's your name? And then have that you type it in for them. Great. What's your what's your uh, email address? Wonderful. And so what what should I tell the sellers about this house? Another question I like to ask, and maybe this is a follow up question, is uh, what is it that. Oh, at what price point would you be willing to submit an offer to submit an offer? I love that question. That's my favorite. Um, that actually goes to the after the open house. So I like to do video call up, uh, video follow ups, um, or calling an appointment setting. I don't really like calling an appointment setting. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you there. I like video text or, uh, if I have them on social media, I might creep them on social media. Hey, thanks for coming by <laughs> the open house. It was wonderful meeting you. Uh, you know, cause you have their email at this point, you can find anything you want. Maybe you send them in and put them on a drip campaign with that information. Uh, thank you cards, uh, invite them to a coffee date. Maybe you set an appointment, maybe they have a CMA, maybe they have questions that you can help them answer. Uh, it doesn't matter, uh, but this is the part where most people, including myself, can do much better. I probably, at this point, would have a business on autopilot if I had focused on these contacts years ago and nurtured them appropriately, but you know, I was too busy chasing after the next person uh, to realize what I had in front of me. So that's uh, my bad. Uh, there was a woman in particular who I spent time time talking with at an open house. I sent her a text, maybe called once, and and that was it. Like that's all I did. Market slowed down a little bit, and so I'm like, oh well, let me go reach out to people that I used to have numbers to and see if they still work. And it was like a year later, she had already bought, sold, and bought again in a year, and I didn't follow up with her. And it, what's worse is, so she was from Canada, uh, and and so I missed out on a potential referral from there, right? That could have been a relationship. I don't know who she knows out there. Altogether, that could have been like six transactions And because I don't know. She could have owned a business. Uh, she could have investment properties. They could have turned in un into unlimited residential or commercial deals and I never would have known because I didn't ask the right questions and I didn't act like I cared. I didn't care. If I didn't call her again, I didn't actually care. And that's on me. Uh, so I'm trying to do much better with that. But, you know, business is going pretty well right now. Uh, it doesn't, it's not an excuse to not. So don't let the frustration of follow up blind you from an opportunity in front of you. And then uh, you should never give up on, you should never give up on follow up because uh, statistically, statistically, according to Tom Ferry, Jason Pantana, NAR, Zillow, all these places, uh, they say the seventh or the eighth touch is where the magic happens if you've given them value along the way. Hey, I just found out, like I'll give a perfect example. I just found this woman, her son is 12 years old and went to college. This is real life. That just happened. I reached out to her today via uh, Instagram on a DM and I sent her a video message. I was like, I just heard about this. Oh my gosh, what's going on? Tell me the story. That was it. 
She called me, we had probably a 45 minute conversation. Crazy, love it. And so we're also scheduled to get lunch next week. And I said, my treat, I'd love to take you out and just talk, haven't seen you in a while. Done, free appointment, don't know where that's gonna go. Uh, found out they have lots of investment properties. You just, the world, the world is strange. Lots of investment properties. They might be able to teach me a bunch of stuff. Remember, this isn't a short game. This is a career. Conversations are, are our jobs. <laughs> That's what we're being paid to do. Just being paid to have conversations with people and then facilitate a connection, whether it's with a house or another person, right? It can be another agent. It can be a buyer seller. It doesn't, right? That's all we're supposed to be doing. And marketing helps get those conversations and houses are the byproduct of the two. Right? Conversations, marketing equals houses. Uh, I'll tell you the last story of my best and last open house. And I'll give you a few resources to download for free. Um, they'll be in the description later. But I remember when I sent out the video invite, I was using a an AR, which is augmented reality, uh, Star Wars character in the invite video. I remember saying something like, hey, I just wanted to introduce you to my open house. It's going to be epic. But while I was doing that, Around me was like a Millennium Falcon and maybe Chewbacca or C-3PO sitting there standing next to me because I, you know, depending on the phone you had at the time, I had an Android, not an iPhone, but depending on the phone, you had the ability to just plop these little things down there. And they, they were never, they weren't there in real life, right? That's why it's augmented uh, reality. So cool. So that was just my intro video. I had a bounce house there for kids to be able to play. I had the events out in the public. I had yard games inside and out. So I had like the connect four in the giant connect four inside. I had a bago outside or cornhole or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I invited agents using reverse prospecting on the MLS. If you don't know what reverse prospecting is, I don't know, put a one in the comments, but uh, that is a huge tool. I remember giving away. So this is all the same open house. This is one event. I had pies. I gave away $1 pies that I got from Walmart. I got like 30 or 40 of them or something like that. Uh, pies from Walmart. And what I did is I invited past clients to come pick up the pies at the house. But I didn't have an office. You know, I'm a, a, like at my brokerage right now, especially I, I'm remote. So the, my office ends up being the listing, the open house or coffee shops, right? That's at, or my studio here for when I'm doing uh, videos, but not to meet people. So I had them come there. Um, I had almost a hundred families come through and the house was mediocre, but I had a lot of deep conversations and sold that, that particular house for like 35,000 over asking, which at the time was insane. Uh, probably had about six deals come from it just from, just from that one event. And I didn't even do any real follow-up. Don't tell my coach about that, but I didn't. Uh, and imagine if I did, gosh, uh, at worst, I could have referred it out to possibly, to possibly 10 more uh, contracts for other agents. Maybe I would have made another $10,000 or better yet, if I would have done it myself and followed up, I could have closed another $100,000. That's it. I think uh, hopefully that helps you with open houses. I'm done here. Mic drop.